fucking two billion dollars of money to house these people. Where is the money? You're stealing every goddamn dollar of it. And what does your goddamn government do? Your FBI, your your homeless, nothing. You just can steal it. Your chief of police, that fucking piece of shit, just ripped us off for a 1.25 million. And that's all you do is steal. So if you're in here, bring up a bag here to the front as I do. Just give us a bag full of money and we'll be on our fucking way. That's the answer. Cash and carry. Get us the fuck out of this place. Fuck you. Have a wonderful day, Mr. Spindler. With more homeless people on our streets and a racketeering, bullshit, fucked up city attorney under Mike Fuhr, the gauntlet continues. People suffering, people dying on our streets, the vulnerable veterans who can't find housing because of Jose Weezer, the Zacateca wetback, and that of you, Mr. Dawson. People of minority and color can't find refuge from this degrading system. Do we want more homelessness? Yes. Do we want more people living in our street? Yes. Do we want more eyesores living in our sidewalks and street? Yes. Why do we say yes? Because we become the fucking yes men of HHH, bitch, bitch, bitch. And it's no one to blame but this local entity of government that continues to suppress people in Los Angeles for service, programs, and activities. It's a fucking shame that we spend federal dollars into the billions to scumbag every fucking message we get across. We're doing nothing. And that's why Eric Garcetti is out there parading like some fucking president when he has nothing shit to do better than to leave homeless people on the street and suck my cock. So as I bring this emergency aid block to your attention, as a reminder, you're taking away property that belongs to the public to build housing and structures that are infrastructurally correct for fucking people who are disabled and elderly to live in. Not this fucking independence lawsuit against you stupid white niggers who make it difficult to manage our system. Fuck you, That's your Austin, time. Goodbye. 42 USC 1983. You disrupt the meeting again. That's your first Mommy. warning. You'll be asked to leave. Mr. Herman, you can keep walking and leave the room. Yes. That actually, as a First Amendment expert, that wasn't a violation. But anyways, I'm going to say it like this. L.A. plan to fail, from my numbers, is 58,000 homeless people between Los Angeles County and Los Angeles City. There's about probably 10 beds available. I had three homeless families that had to come live with me, and I went to Hoppix to try to get them uh, housing. But there's no housing available. So... Here's what's, what's happening. $365 million is coming down through property, Prop H. But there's not enough money to house the people in the city of Los Angeles. You guys have failed because it's going to be 2022 before you, you guys have units available for these people. So you guys got the money, but you guys have no housing. It doesn't add up. It doesn't make any sense. And then we're arresting people. It's costing me ten thousand dollars to book a person because you guys want everybody from venice is in west l.a is going downtown that's from one of the chiefs that i talked to and i talk to him very often so here's what i'm saying you guys can give them housing vouchers instead of taking them to jail which costs the city a lot less four hundred and fifty six hundred dollars for a hotel voucher versus twelve thousand dollars for arrest and uh what's the name so you, you guys need to take the money and utilize it and also, in my area, there's lots of homeless people, but we don't have money to, or we don't have housing for them. I went to three different programs, and it never got done. And I worked in 
current prices district, or I live in current prices district, and it's a shame that these families had to come live with me, and they couldn't even get hotel vouchers, and it's a family of five, a family of three, and a family of two. They all had to come stay with me with no hotel vouchers. It's a big problem. The money needs to be utilized for the homeless people, not for uh, hiring people. Thank you. Council members, Paul Dumont with the Silmar Neighborhood Council. Um, I wanted to address you on two of the items, both items that are on your agenda. The first item is for uh, a community impact statement we filed for the City Attorney's Heart Program, Council File 180506. Um, we actually had an opportunity to thoroughly discuss the ordinance, collect input from our stakeholders in our homeless committee meeting on the Neighborhood Council, and brought it back to our full board which unanimously approved a community impact statement supporting um, accepting the funds from the county. As one of our stakeholders put it so eloquently, he said, quote, it's a no-brainer, unquote. So thank you for your support on uh, clearing citations for our uh, stakeholders experiencing homelessness. As you know, that's one of the biggest barriers that we find is criminal records and outstanding warrants, uh, trying to help ex-offenders and uh, people experiencing homelessness to achieve housing stability. Regarding agenda item number two, I haven't read the whole thing, and I would we have not vetted it in our committee or addressed it at our board, but I wanted to um, comment regarding the bridge housing in general and the role that neighbor councils could play in expanding capacity to get people off the streets. Um, the, the bridge housing plan and concept is brilliant in so much as it incentivizes council members to cite how desperately needed housing and rewards those council districts with additional police and sanitation efforts. Although there's a lot of dispute in the communities as to whether or not that will help end homelessness, um, I would offer that the incentives should be expanded to the neighborhood council level in the form of neighborhood purpose grants or beautification grants um, to neighborhood councils that cite a homeless housing, bridge housing. Um, there's 100 neighborhood councils roughly. If they each cited 100 beds, um, we could expand capacity in a number that might make a serious dent in the number of people living on their streets. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, that concludes our multiple item uh, speakers. Uh, can we read item number one into the record for consideration? Item number one. <clears throat> it's a communication from the city attorney and the city administrative officer report regarding fiscal year 2018-19 funding to enhance the city attorney's homeless engagement and response team known as HART. Excellent. So uh, I believe we have uh, some feedback on that. But before that, uh, we have three speakers on this item. Uh, Monica Alcaraz, Hugo Villa, and Steve Feicher. Fetcher? If any or all of you are here, you'll come to the mic. You can speak in any order. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. I'm Steve Victor. I'm the regional director for PATH, um, People Assisting the Homeless Metro LA Programming. I'm actually here to speak in favor of the allocation. I hope I put my name in the right place. Um, we just want to speak in favor of, of that allocation and to um, plant some seeds for some creative usages of these um, bridge housing opportunities once um, the funding is um, transformed and people are ready to move into permanent supportive housing. Um, so I'm simply here to speak in favor and thank you for your time. All right. Uh, seeing none of the other speakers, uh, colleagues, are there any questions or comments on this matter? Oh, here she comes. Yes, ma'am. I'm really sorry. Um, is this just for the first, the heart program? Or this is for item number one. What's your name? My name is Monica Alcaraz. And That's you. Yes. You're on. I'm the CS coordinator for Northeast, and I really would like to encourage the support for the heart program. Um, I work with the homeless, and I feel that this program really does help them um, get their life on track as we work towards housing with them. So the more money and the more support they get, the better. That's all I want to say. Thank you. So, uh, Monica, you, you have a couple cards in, and I missed you in the beginning, so you can uh, make the rest of your comments now. Um, so I'm the CS coordinator for Northeast. I work from Boyle Heights to Atwater Village. I feel that this pot of money that's coming in 
really needs to be spread out, um, decentralizing services. I know that there's a lot of money going into um, Skid Row, but we need services in Northeast. We do not have a homeless service provider in, ho in Northeast proper, other than uh, Recycle Resources, with, which is a nonprofit organization that I volunteer with, and we do need services there. We need housing. We need money to be spread out throughout the city, not just in Skid Row, um, although I, I'm not saying to take away from that. Um, and then we also need services like AmeriCorps members to help with um, people that are doing the work um, ground level. We do have a lot of um, more outreach works coming in, but there's support that we need. Um, and um, I'm, I'm just saying that other service providers or we need service providers in other areas, not just in downtown. Thank you. Um, so unless there are any comments, which I do not see any from uh, our colleagues, colleague, uh, questions or comments, we'll take this item on consent. Uh, and we'll move to item number two. Item number two is a motion by Harris Dawson, Wesson, and Bonin regarding submitting an application to the state for funding from the emergency aid block grants to local governments in the 2018-19 state budget and for the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority to verbally report on the matter. Thank you so much. Uh, so we have three speakers on this that I want to call up before uh, we go to public comment because some of the questions might be addressed by them. Uh, we have Commander Choi from uh, LAPD. Uh, we have Ms. Reisman from the County of Los Angeles and uh, Ms. Marquez from HCID. If you could join us at the center table um, and apprise us of your comments with regard to this matter. Good afternoon, council members. Um, just some brief comments. I had an had a opportunity to look at the motion, and um, it's great that we're getting state funding for this issue. Being the Department of Homeless Coordinator for LAPD, um, you know, again, homelessness isn't going to be solved by law enforcement or arresting our way out of it. But there is a place for law enforcement in this effort. Um, potentially, I'd like to see some of this money coming towards maybe a jail inreach program, a way that we can uh, reduce the barriers for these individuals for entry and I and I see some of the opportunities in this motion so I would just like to see on behalf of LAPD um, it's cons I see it as consistent with our city strategy county strategy um, and, and we support it so it's just basic straightforward comments thank you good afternoon council members Molly Reisman with Supervisor Sheila Kuehl's office uh, we're excited to be here today and excited about this funding opportunity we feel strongly that these funds will have the greatest impact on homelessness in Los Angeles if we align the state funding um, coming to the city and coming to LASA together and with Measure H. Aligning our funds by prioritizing investments and expanding capacity of existing programs such as bridge housing, prevention, rapid rehousing, the coordinated entry system will allow us to reach a greater number of people experiencing homelessness while also ensuring that our expanded capacity is sustainable. We are also committed to using Measure H to ensure that providers do not have to be limited by the 5% admin cap that the state has put on these funds. We're very concerned about that admin cap. Our providers are stretched very thin right now and 5% 5 does not cover their indirect costs. Um, I think if the city and LASA and the county align together, we can leverage Measure H to help cover those indirect costs, which will make this funding uh, more effective. Um, and as I said, we're also really committed to trying to align our funding so that this will be sustainable. This is one-time funds, but you know, if we align it well with Measure H, we can ensure that the investments we make um, create expanded capacity uh, for the long term and not just for the brief time this funding is available. We're very grateful to the city for your partnership with the county and look forward to using this opportunity to expand that partnership. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, Council Members. Abigail Marquez with the Housing and Community Investment Department. I would also like to take this opportunity to encourage the Mayor and Council to consider using HEAP funds to expand and augment existing homeless prevention strategies. Every day, and this is something that we're all very well aware of, we see an increasing number of Angelinos who are at risk of becoming homeless. And we've all been too far too familiar with the current uh, loss of homeless count results, but there was an increase this year in the number of families who experienced homelessness for the very first time. It represents 30% of our city's homeless population. We feel that uh, at each city we have, a, we have a unique opportunity as a city to align and expand existing homeless prevention strategies by leveraging our city's family source system. We currently fund 16 family source centers that are strategically and geographically located in areas of the city with the highest concentrations of poverty. We currently serve 50,000 unduplicated low-income families every year, and this is an unduplicated number that represent approximately 30% are single women, single, mo single mothers, 95% are low-income people of color, 84% of them are renters, 81% are extremely low income with an average annual income of $10,300. We are, um, we've been very proud of our family source system as an outcome driven, metrics driven system. All of our agencies are meeting or exceeding their performance goals. So in addition to serving the 50,000 people, they are tracking the academic gains of young people and their parents and increasing family income. Our family source centers are currently serving homeless families. So for the last two years, we have been tracking the number of homeless families that are coming in through our doors. From 2016 to 2017, we had a little over a thousand families that self-identified as homeless. In this last year that we just finished in June, we saw well over 2,500 individuals that identified as homeless. It represents a 59% increase from 2016. I want to just also underscore that the homeless question is an optional question, so we know that it's vastly underreported. We've also been working very closely with LASA for the last two years to look at how to align our family source system with the family solution system. We've revamped our intake process, so we have now very pointed questions that we're asking families to better capture the state of crisis that they're in and how to best refer them to LASA and to the family solution system. Uh, we also are very proud of a unique service that we offer through the Family Source System, which is a very robust financial coaching program. We've spent a lot of time building the capacity of our system to have financial coaches at all of our Family Source Centers that are looking at reducing family debt, they're looking at improving FICO scores, they're opening checking and savings accounts for families, families that are not earning, again, average earning is $10,000, and yet we have families in our system that are saving with no match $2,000, $1,000, $2,500. This year alone, um, through our tax program, we helped families claim over $10 million in tax credits from the earned income tax credit, the child tax credit, and some of these other very valuable tax credits. Um, and again, I, I talked about how we've been aligning our family solution system. I'm so glad that Molly is here, um, and she's been an incredible resource um, and asset to us. Um, through the support of, Council, of Supervisor Sheila Kuehl, she allocated 300,000 of her own discretionary money to pilot a homeless prevention program that we have, um, we're gonna be launching this month in partnership with LASA and our Family Solution Center in Van Nuys, LA Family Housing, along with New Economics for Women. It, this pilot program is different in that it's proactively identifying families who are demonstrating risk of becoming displaced and then eventually becoming homeless. So we know that we are in the very early stages of planning um, for this submission and providing recommendations. We just wanted to make, you know, to underscore the value of the city's family source system in helping to address this need. It's an unmet need. We know that families, again, are coming in. When we're, bringing, when we're referring them and they have a three-day notice, oftentimes it's hard for them to stay in their unit and to 
not be displaced and become homeless. What we're trying to do through these strategies is to identify them early on when they are one month behind as opposed to three months behind on their rent to provide them support and help them stabilize and then integrate our financial coaching services so that they're not in this situation, vulnerable situation again. So we're here to have, uh, happy to answer any questions. We know that there's still a lot that we need to do to iron out a fully fledged out proposal. Um, and we're of course going to be engaging with LASA and the CAO and other key entities to come back to you with a concrete proposal for you to consider. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, any questions or comments for our panelists? Mr. Price. This is an exciting uh, source of revenue uh, for, for our programs. And let me just be clear, this is for services and only. Is that correct? Just services? I hear I, it's kind of nodding and I didn't hear the second, services and. No, I'm asking, is it just for services, this money, this 500,000, 500 million earmarked for services, not? Uh, do, we, do we need someone from the CAO's or mayor's office to help us with that? Mr. Price's question. It's, it's, is it's this money uh, limited to services or does it cover other categories? Our homelessness czar. Good afternoon, Meg Barkley, uh, City Homes Coordinator in the CAO's office. Uh, the money is not, it, it's not limited to services, but it is really important to notice that, note that it's one-time funding and there's a, there are commitment and expenditure deadlines that are very tight. And so we'd need to be able, if we're allocating to capital, for example, we want to be able to allocate it to projects that can spend within, by the expenditure deadline, which is, um, sorry, excuse me, it is, all the funds have to be spent by June 30th, 2021. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Wizar? Overall, or? Do you have a question or comment? For the panelists or generally? For the panelists. Oh, no. Not for me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. I mean, overall, I think this is, um, frankly, about time that the state has stepped up and assisted local government with many of the needs for our homeless. Uh, it's been a long time coming, and we've got to recognize that in this crisis, uh, this type of support for our local governments, which is bursting at the seams, uh, is going to go a long way. The recommendations that have been made are, uh, are good recommendations that I support, particularly uh, in Skid Row, where we're looking to uh, house or shelter 2,000 individuals who sleep on the sidewalk each night. Uh, we've been working to identify sites. Um, what I like about our approach now is that uh, we are not only looking to find um, vacant land to put um, bungalows and other things, but also we're now moving the um, new territory that the city has never really undertaken, is, and that is to find new structures, existing structures, public or private, that would be able to house um, uh, unsheltered individuals. Uh, here in downtown LA, uh, we uh, are homelessness czar. <laughs> I like that title better. I was rooting for that, but we people voted for coordinator. But um, uh, we you, you identified uh, several. Uh, we we weren't as uh, lucky as we thought we could be in finding available sites around the Skid Row area. Uh, what came of that, however, was a partnership with the county on Paloma Street to find an old warehouse on private property that we will lease. Uh, in, in, in partnership with the county uh, to house more individuals. Uh, we also found the uh, Children's Museum, uh, former Children's Museum that's been sitting vacant uh, that we're moving forward with. We've authorized uh, staff to look at that and the feasibility. Uh, so that's the new direction that we're going into to house the 2,000 individuals that sleep on the streets. But what's different this time as well um, is, one, that it's new territory for the city. Typically, the county has been doing this type of work. But secondly, we have funding to do it. This money that would come from the state, the $20 million, will also or can also be matched with $10 million that is in the unappropriated balance from our general fund uh, for such purpose in the Skid Row area. And secondly, the $20 million that the mayor has allocated for each council district uh, to be split amongst each council district, and he's urging uh, council members to work with uh, his administration to find those sites. So the good news is that we have funding available. Now the hard work begins to have go out and find the sites and make it happen. The other parts of this is that uh, with respect to the uh, HCAD and their proposal for eviction uh, prevention strategies, it was noted that the largest demographic now uh, one of the largest demographics we see in the homeless population are families, 
and people who simply cannot pay rent. Um, and I think it's, it, they go hand in hand with families in that. So working towards the prevention of homelessness uh, is um, a good way to spend this money. Um, and so overall, I, uh, Council Member Harris Dawson, I, 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 um, my message today is one, um, we appreciate the state stepping forward and uh, it's about time. We would hope they do more. And secondly, uh, what uh, the city did its homework up front uh, to have something available and show where we could use this money and apply for it is uh, we, were way, we were ahead of the game, I think, in doing that. So thank you to everyone who, who worked on this. My final point is this, and that although we appreciate this funding coming from the state and it's long time coming, uh, the state also has to step up and do a lot more in mental health. Um, given that a third of our population have mental health issues or an illness and that our system is quite frankly broken uh, and we need to change the definition of gravely disabled the state so that we not only hold individuals through law enforcement for 72 hours but instead get more medical attention to these individuals and treat them for the illness they have and even if we do that we have no place to place them uh, very limited psychiatric hospitals which is really a function of the state to step forward and the federal government to step forward and do a lot more in those areas as well so overall in our state uh, lobbying that we do we've got to send the message thank you this financial assistance helps we need more of this but at the same time legislative support and long-term long thinking for mental health would go a long way too thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Wizar, and thank you, uh, panelists. Uh, we have about uh, 15 public comment speakers uh, that we'll call forward now, and uh, then we'll hear from Lhasa and the CAO uh, after that's concluded. Uh, and I, I would just begin this process by um, giving a big shout out and thanks to our mayor, uh, Eric Garcetti, for helping convene a group of mayors to. Uh, get the state to make this uh, one-time investment and at least um, get uh, financial acknowledgement uh, from the state that this homelessness is uh, a central issue uh, here, not just in Los Angeles, but in the state of California. So we'll begin our public comment speakers at this point uh, with Mr. Jim Bickhart, then Veronica Lewis, and Diego Rodriguez. Thank you, members of the committee. Uh, Jim Bickhart, representing Council Member Kuretz. Um, Mr. Kuretz asked me to come down and just uh, f first thank you for giving people an opportunity to comment on this uh, important matter. Also, to reinforce the inclusion of funding for safe parking in this application. Uh, also, uh, to provide to encourage you to provide flexibility for alternative modes of service delivery such as shared collaborative housing which has been used uh, effectively in a pilot program in CD11 over the last year or two um, provides a good as they say bang for the buck and then finally in terms of homelessness prevention as mentioned by Councilmember Huizar um, you'll be voting on uh, the right to counsel uh, proposal in council on Friday and we hope that there will be flexibility in this application to fund that kind of an effort as well. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Good afternoon. Veronica Lewis from Hot Bakes. Um, I've stood before you several times to encourage the city to invest to address homelessness. Pull, so pull I'm very the grateful closer. to have an yeah, opportunity pull, pull, pull. Yeah, we can. to there you go. Um, stand before the city and share my brief thoughts about how we can maximize the utilization of the, the much overdue um, state resources. Just in general, I just want to uh, share that I strongly support um, the use of these funds to fill whatever appropriate gaps there are to Prop H so that we can expedite the onboarding of some of these housing units. I also um, feel very strongly about expanding the concept of safe parking to ensure that folks that are using their vehicles as an alternative to um, shelter have a safe place to go. Um, a few quick considerations. One, I think it's important to build off the existing strategies, but I want to. I hope that we can be creative with how we use some of these monies and don't just don't just get stuck in the same. We do it this way because we do it this way, and allow ourselves to pilot and really test new um, ways to do things. 
Um, and then finally, really quickly, just making sure that the services that are attached to a bridge home are actually valuable, client-centered, that the caseloads aren't ridiculous, and that people can actually serve the people in those interim housing units. Thank you. Thank you. We have Amara, Emily Contrim, Erica Herod, after Mr. Rodriguez. Thank you. Good afternoon, committee members. My name is Diego Rodriguez, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Alma Family Services. We provide mental health and a wide range of services across uh, LA City and County through 17 clinics. Uh, and we serve many individuals that are struggling with housing insecurity and uh, homelessness. I just want to sh share that I truly appreciate Councilmember Wizard's statement just now. Um, it is true that the incidence of mental health is a non contributor when it comes to homelessness, uh, but it's also true that the experience of homelessness triggers. Uh, a number of moderate to severe symptoms, including anxiety, depression, paranoia, and hopelessness. And I think of the many uh, examples that I could provide that embodies this, the, this crisis, I can think of a 14-year-old boy who recently uh, shared with me his struggle uh, through the last year, living in his car with his family, um, struggling at school, becoming system involved, and um, dreaming really of having a bed um, and having the safety of a home. So I would like to speak in strong support of this plan um, and I really hope that leads to leveraging and opportunities Thank you uh, so much. for more mental health services and programs. Thank Thanks you. so much. Hello, my name is Amara Ananibu. Um, I am a member of the Neighborhood Council here but I'm speaking in my own capacity today. I'm also... Um, um, a homelessness liaison. Which for, neighborhood council? Downtown. Sorry. Hello, council member. Um, I also had the privilege of canvassing with council member Bonin and advocating for a bridge home. So I am in support of this funding, but I have enmeshed myself in this issue for the last couple of years, and um, I want to just tell you what I see and where I hope some of the funding will go. Um, one is outreach training. Um, I volunteer with Reset on a weekly basis, and the things that I have seen. Um, there needs to be outreach training. I, I love what everyone's doing, but I feel like outreach workers need to be half pastor and half sales and never give up. And that a really funding needs to go into finding the right people who are gonna get people off the street and not give up until they do. Um, incentives for a bridge home, getting people into bridge housing. There has to be some sort of escrow or job training um, that is an incentive that lifts people out of poverty, alliances, Please work with getting people what they need, where they need it, whether that's TV shots, IDs, it needs to be where they are. No more shuffling people from place to place. We're losing people. So I encourage you to innovate, innovate, innovate with these dollars. We really need new minds and we need the system to be more. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. Herman, please be seated or depart. Emily Weta Cantrum, Safe Parking LA. Um, with just a minute on the clock, I'll just tell you two aspects of safe parking programs uh, that would be of great value to this committee. Um, safe parking programs are implementable almost immediately and are largely embraced by communities. I gave two presentations at neighborhood council meetings in Koreatown where people came out in strong opposition to bridge housing, whereas safe parking was met with no resistance. Instead, community members of neighborhood council and other community members have uh, volunteered at our program, and after six months of operation, we are still at zero complaints to the council district and zero calls to law enforcement. This neighborhood buy-in for local solutions is crucial to addressing homelessness and building it through safe parking programs and a combination of publicly owned and faith community properties is how we'll get bridge and supportive housing in every council district in the city. Safe parking is an immediate solution for someone experiencing homelessness in their vehicle, connecting them to valuable services they may not have known are available to them already. And we can see those solutions in our neighborhoods with safe parking. Thanks. Thank you. Hello, my name is Erica and I work with Homeless Youth Services and at Safe Place for Youth in Venice. Um, the main thing that I saw that was an issue for me was the 5.75 that is going to youth and family housing and services. For that specifically, I think youth and family should be separate because it's two different situations for families. Um, more money, I would say, needs to be put into mental health services, specifically if they have children who are in need of those services. Um, youth as well are in need of those services. 
specifically for the ones who don't really have anyone who are on their side or anyone to talk to. Um, more uh, substance use treatment for those two specifically. I know uh, for some of the people we work with, that's one of our main issues is the substance use and mental health and we don't have enough of that uh, support. Uh, and yeah, that's all I have. Thank you. We have Angela Labou, Nancy Volpert, Stephanie Jager, Linda Lux. Hi. You're on. What's your name? Good afternoon. I'm Angela Labou, Chief Operations Officer at CRCD, the Coalition for Responsible Community Development. We take a comprehensive approach to addressing homelessness by, de by developing and directly providing housing with support services, prevention and diversion supports, employment training and placement and education and vocational services in South LA specifically. On behalf of our organization, I want to express our wholehearted support of the motion to submit this application to the state. I definitely echo the concern around the 5% cap on the administrative costs because the more that we're processing direct financial assistance, like rental um, assistance to um, partners in the community that does take a lift on the administrative side. Um, the, in the time that I have left, I really want to echo what Erica from SPY was saying. Um, seeing the language for that there's uh, funding specifically for youth and their families, when the, ma the majority of young people we're seeing on the street are unaccompanied is concerning. And so I just want to highlight that. Um, and hopefully that'll be something that can be reconsidered. Thank you. So folks, as folks are speaking, you should know that uh, LASA and the CAO's office will speak after you, so some of your concerns or questions will get addressed in their presentation. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Hi, I'm Nancy Volpert with Jewish Family Service of Los Angeles. Thank you so much for having us and for having this kind of important conversation. We are deeply appreciative of, of the proposal that's been brought forward. We think there are a few places where we would like you to have additional conversations because as we all know, there are multiple paths into homelessness, and so we need to make sure that the programs we are providing are gonna to respond to these multiple paths. As Ms. Marquez mo mentioned, there was a 20% jump in family homelessness in the last point in time count. There was a 21% jump in older adult homelessness. And none of the systems that we've de designed so far have really been able to start attacking that population who are gonna have long-term needs that are different from uh, those of the people who are younger and experiencing homelessness. In addition, the needs of survivors of domestic violence and their families for safety also require some different paths, and we hope you will look at those as you look at how you develop the final proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Stephanie Jager. I'm the director of NOHO Home Alliance, which is a small uh, um, social service provider in North Hollywood. As you can see, I'm also clergy. I'm the pastor of a church that incubated that program. And I'm here today to just express my delight that 85 million will be coming from the state and that you'll be using that to um, further the work in our city. I do want to lift up just a couple of concerns. Um, one is the very short deadline, December 31st, for the allocation of funds. Uh, I am concerned that in um, the eastern San Fernando Valley where I am that the density is so high it's so difficult to identify sites um, that I'm concerned about losing access to those funds um, there. And then also in regard to the 10 million that is allocated to various homeless services that you perhaps um, add that um, you're not limiting uh, the monies to those services uh, identified and I also want to urge you to work again with the uh, churches in your areas. There are uh, churches are large property holders and I would just like to invite you to redouble your efforts to reach out to bishops um, in, the, in the city um, to Thank identify you. property there. Thank you. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Linda Lux and I'm here speaking on behalf of Venice Community Housing. Um, we have the opportunity to bring long overdue and best practice programs to the residents experiencing homelessness at a scale that we haven't seen in decades. We need you to ensure that all of it goes to assist those most in need with programs, housing, and resources that work and not wasted on more enforcement and criminalization policies. Clean streets, sanitation, Operation Healthy Streets, or enhanced enforcement zones are planned 
where up to 10 million is already currently allocated are not homeless programs in their current form and impact. These new pro funds, one-time funds, are, allocate, are supposed to be allocated for homeless programs that actually serve the homeless. So we urge you to use best practices and not use any of that money to further criminalize people who have no place to go. We also urge you to revisit the original. Tw oh, Thank you. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Much appreciate it. Uh, we've got Ali Cadillac, Kadja Nelson, uh, Janet Kelly, and Douglas Walker. Hello, I'm Ali Cadillac. I'm also representing Venice Community Housing. VCH does support the efforts to create crisis and bridge housing on a short timeline, but we strongly oppose the sanitation and enhanced enforcement plans that come with the shelter plans. This allocation of $85 million from the state is urgently needed, but must focus on best practice interventions, such as removing prohibitions against couples, pets, and belongings, while respecting and accommodating people who will live there. We need to ensure that all of it goes to assist those most in need with programs, housing, and resources that work, not wasted on failed criminalization policies and the continuation of failed attempts to push people out of our communities without any alternatives. We also urge you to revisit the original 29 million allocated in city funds to sanitation and enforcement associated with a bridge home, or at the very least, not add to those funds today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Katya Nelson, and I'm with the Government Affairs Department at APLA Health. And um, I'm here to ask that you consider the um, homeless prevention and housing needs of people living with HIV um, with some of this new funding, specifically the $10 million that was apparently going to you know, various um, programs. And so, as you might know, stable housing is one of the most critical interventions for keeping people living with HIV healthy to help improve health outcomes and is actually a really effective um, prevention method for um, reducing the number of new transmissions. Um, and so, there, even though there is um, federal funding through HOPWA, there are still a lot of challenges in helping people find stable housing. Um, for example, they're able to put, we're able to pay for 60 days of temporary housing, but beyond that, there really isn't any mechanism. And so a lot of times people have to return to the street and they fall out of care. And so we just, we want to ask you to consider whether some of that money could be used towards you know, something like that. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Janet Kelly, Sanctuary of Hope. I just want to say that I'm very concerned with one allocation and the numbers as it relates to homeless youth. The 5.75 million is not enough, and it, and it appears does not meet the basic requirements of having 5% set aside and designated for homeless youth, meaning that currently we're asking to split 7% between uh, youth and families, and young people, um, are one of the highest needs or unsheltered populations here within Los Angeles County, with us being, I guess, number two in the nation. So I really would like for us to go back and revisit that, because if we're talking about there's a 5% requirement, a minimum 4.2 million should be going towards youth um, homeless services, and especially in marginalized communities such as CD8, 9, and 10, we need youth shelter for youth under the age of 18. My name is Douglas Walker. I work with homeless people in Hollywood. I'd like to comment also on the $10 million earmarked to various service programs, which include clean streets and sanitation programs. I think at some point it will be important that we recognize that emergency services on the street, and I don't mean cleaning up a big mess and then waiting for it to reaccumulate again, I would strongly urge that we aggressively implement expansion of the pit stop program, sharps collections, and meaningful trash collection, such as it being piloted right now by the sanitation department with the, the bags, trash bags, and a way to actually have that trash picked up. This would allow the neighbors to calm down. It would allow the people who are outside, living outside to calm down, and allow them to live in dignity rather than perpetual being swept from one place to another. Thank you. 
have uh, Tammy Membreno and Paul Pott. Good afternoon. My name is Tammy Membreno. I'm the executive director of Barrio Action Youth and Family Center. Barrio Action is one of the uh, 16 family source centers that covers the El Sereno and Lincoln Heights area. As Ms. Marquez uh, uh, spoke earlier about the increase in number of homelessness, we also experience a lot of the families who have come to us with very little resources. Uh, with the hiking um, in the rents, a lot of these families end up really being homeless uh, immediately after giving the quick ev evictions. So we have families living in cars and uh, now moving into their other family members with the limited time to be there. So I think that we have to be proactive and uh, we appreciate the, the uh, opportunity to be able to get uh, more resources coming to these families for prevention, making sure that they have adequate uh, resources out in the community, but also somewhere where to go and, and get these resources uh, as well. Uh, one of the things that we also see uh, need to speak about is also the immigrant uh, families who have less of a chance of getting a home uh, or getting resources as well. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. All right, that concludes our public comment speakers for uh, this item, I think we have representatives from LASA and the CAO's office. Um, to shed more light on this. Sarah Main, I'm the Director of Policy and Systems at LASA. Thank you for um, inviting us here to share with you uh, LASA's proposed uses for the Continuum of Care funds uh, for the Los Angeles Continuum of Care. Uh, we are expecting uh, to be able to apply for 80, about $80 million in, in these one-time funds uh, and, uh, and are really looking to do two things. The first is really just to be extending the reach of, um, of Measure H resources and helping to bridge an anticipated gap, uh, funding gap in year three of Measure H uh, that's due to a state decision to not begin collecting those revenues uh, until October. Um, and uh, with, you know, we've had one year of implementation of Measure H resources, which is wonderful and added a lot of capacity to our coordinated homeless system to serve more people, uh, but there continue to be some, some gaps and some opportunities to add some enhancements. So looking uh, at how we might be able to use those funds to do that as well. Um, two uh, pieces of, uh, of information that are, are, again, are informing this uh, that was referenced earlier. One is that there's a 5% uh, administration, administrative overhead cap on this, uh, which would severely inhibit uh, really effective use of these funds and are grateful for the, the county acknowledging that and, and offering Measure H to help offset that. The other is that there is a 5% requirement, uh, a minimum 5% that's used for youth. So as I discuss the proposed uses for Los Angeles Continuum of Care, um, there's different areas and we see youth being served through all of these areas. Um, so, uh, so there's four primary areas uh, that we're looking at. Um, one is uh, in alignment with uh, counting strategy uh, A1A5, which is homelessness prevention and diversion. Uh, through Measure H, we have now established homeless prevention programs uh, with the coordinated entry system for families with children, for adults, and for youth. Uh, they're showing really effective, promising results. Uh, in the first year of Measure H, we served about 935 families um, and, uh, and got program going for, for youth and for uh, adults um, that served 241 with an 89% success rate of, of keeping households in, in those units. Um, while those uh, programs are um, showing great results, we've identified that there's a need um, to be providing uh, rapid resolution and, and diversion support, not just at the front end of some, when someone is first entering uh, or, or coming to the homeless system, but that there are opportunities throughout the engagement of working with someone that you can provide just a small bit of financial assistance to help resolve their, their housing crisis and get them into permanent housing. And so our service providers have strongly asked for a flexible pot of funding to be able to tap into um, to, to provide those kind of interventions. So we would use funds to create such a flexible pot. Uh, we also... Um, where, where, as that, where is that pot on, sure. your, on your list here? Where is that pot on, on this proposed list of expenditures? I, I don't, we don't... Does it, does it exist? Where would it come out of? I'm just curious. Do they have the stuff in? Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't 
So to clarify, um, Sarah's speaking to the proposed uses for the funds that the continuum of care, or that LASA will receive on behalf of the LA County Continuum of Care. Um, and so maybe you want to run through the list and the amounts since you don't have that okay. document. Sure. So there's about 80, as I said, there's about $80 million. In addition to the $85 million oh, okay. that the city of LA, there's $80 million to the Los Angeles Continuum of Care. Okay. So there's four areas that we're looking at. The first is the prevention and diversion, which I'm explaining. We're proposing using about 20% of the funding, $16 million for that purpose. The second is rapid rehousing. So that's $12 million, about 15% of the funding. Um, uh, strengthening the coordinated entry system, we're proposing using about 10% of the funding, or $8 million. And then the bulk of the funding, 55%, to um, uh, interim housing. Uh, so that's 45, $44 million. Um, so again, just more details on the prevention diversion piece. Again, trying to have a flexible pot of funding that we can be doing rapid resolution throughout an engagement with someone. Um, also, there's been just tremendous inflow um, of people into homelessness. Our homeless count last year showed that almost 10,000 people um, who we counted in the Los Angeles Continuum of Care were newly homeless in that year. Um, and you know, there and there's really a need um, to be placing more um, more staff at those entry points um, or at the key places of referral to be having problem solving conversations to help identify is there another way to help someone resolve their housing um, crisis without having to come into the homeless system. Um, so we're proposing funding some positions to do that. Uh, the second area of funding that we're proposing for, for the LACOCs is, uh, is rapid rehousing. Uh, we have um, uh, a good amount of rapid rehousing resources through Measure Age for families, for youth, and for adults. Um, however, there, there are still some, some gaps um, that we're looking to fill. The first is, as, as you know, last year we saw a tremendous increase in families that came into the family system. Um, the Board of Supervisors at the county enabled us to shift some funding around to meet that immediate need. Um, however, the caseloads in the family system have remained very high. Um, and so we want to use some of this funding to add some supplemental staff to bring those caseloads down and enable the family rapid rehousing programs to, to be more effective in, in getting families housed. Um, the second piece is we've seen locally that rapid rehousing is a particularly effective uh, solution for, for youth um, and want to be able to increase the rapid rehousing capacity for, for the youth programs. Um, and then finally, we have a, uh, a new CES housing location program. So this is a, uh, a program that works with landlords to secure units that we can house uh, homeless, informally homeless persons in. Um, however, that program, um, we, we didn't budget for it to be able to have holding fees to be able to hold the units that those kind of holding fees are available um, through the HIP program with the housing authorities for federal vouchers but we don't have that same sort of holding fee benefit for rapid rehousing programs so we'd like to supplement it so that we can hold hold units for for rapid rehousing participants as well um, for both of these areas, for both prevention and rapid rehousing, the continuum also would recommend that the city consider uh, those uses uh, with city resources as well in alignment. Um, the third area that we're looking at, again, is strengthening the coordinated entry system. Uh, I haven't pulled the list this week. I pulled it last week. We have 23,911 persons who are on our uh, list of people who have been assessed, who are saying, I'm, I want housing, and who are awaiting a housing resource to become available. Um, which is great. It means the outreach workers and our access points have done a good job of, of engaging those people. Um, but they continue to need support while they're waiting for a housing resource to become available. Um, and we call that a housing navigation function within our coordinated interest system. And we don't have enough housing navigators to continue to work with people on getting connected to services, to resources, having their documents ready so that when housing becomes available, they can move quickly, as quickly as possible through that process. So we recommend supplementing um, our housing navigation resources. Um, as well as we have some access centers. So our coordinated entry system is a no wrong door approach, no matter where you go, you can get into the system. However, it's very helpful to have clear front doors. Um, and those clear front doors uh, don't they currently struggle to be able to handle the inflow of people that are coming in seeking help and, and being able to do assessments. So we'd like to enhance their capacity to handle the inflow as well as um, provide opportunity to create some more access centers and, and more clear front doors into the system, particularly on the, the adult side. 
Um, and then finally, uh, as I explained, the bulk of the resources uh, for the continuum of CARES funding we're recommending go into interim housing, uh, 44 million. And this would be to finance um, operations of new interim housing beds uh, throughout the county and including in the city, as well as um, capital costs associated with um, the creation of those beds. Um, so for uh, uh, this um, committee's purpose, just so you know, uh, LASA um, is uh, facilitating right now um, a, 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 um, a community input process. We're going out to each of the service planning areas, presenting this plan, seeking feedback, coming to bodies such as yourself. Also would love your feedback on our plan. Um, and uh, ultimately we'll be going to our um, continuum of care board with these recommendations for final approval by our commission. Thank you. Ms. Barclay. Good afternoon. So I wanted to start off with a review of the program requirements based on the most recent guidance from the California Business Consumer and Housing Agency, which is administering these funds. Um, and the most recent guidance was released on August 10th of this, August 10th, so last Friday. The, the program overall, it's a $500 million block grant program designed to provide a direct assistance to cities and continuums of care and counties to address homelessness. Um, uh, the available funding total for the city, um, based on the formulas, is that we would receive about $85 million directly to the city of Los Angeles, and the Los Angeles and, and city and county continuum of care, which is administered by LASA, would receive about $81 million. The um, eligible uses are for imme immediate emergency assistance, and again, this is one-time funding. Um, oh, it should also be noted, as, as you've heard across a lot of the um, testimony today that there's only 5% of the grant, both for the continuum of care and the city, can be used for administrative costs. Um, the other eligible uses are immediate emergency assistance to people experiencing homelessness, including prevention, uh, criminal justice diversion programs for individuals with mental health needs, um, establishing or expanding services for to meet the needs of homeless youth or youth at risk of homelessness, which is the language in, this, in the statute, as opposed to, I think there may be some confusion, the, the motion is a little bit, is broader than that, but the 5% the actually has to be spent on um, youth or youth who are homeless or at risk of homelessness. Um, and emergency aid like shelters, both capital and operating, bathroom, shower facilities, things like that. And I'm just kind of going through the handout that we provided for for the committee today. Uh, as I alluded to before, there are some um, encumbrance and expenditure deadlines. 50% 50, 50 of the funds have to be contractually obligated or encumbered by January 1st of 2020, and 100% of the funds have to be expended by June 30th, tw uh, 2021. Any unexpended funds will revert to the state general fund at, at that time. The, it also requires that a, any city that is going to receive these funds have um, declared a shelter crisis. As you recall, our shelter crisis was declared in April of this year, uh, and so we're, we're, we're covered there. And the state is also planning to do two rounds of funding. So the first round, the application period opens on September 5th and it closes December, 30, or December 31st of this year. And the second round opens on February 15th and closes on April 30th of next year. Any funds that aren't claimed in the first round would be redistributed in the second round, which is why it's really important that we apply for our full eligible allocation of the 80, of $85 million. So um, next steps, we will, we've been monitoring the process with the state as far as the application guidelines. We expect the draft application to be released um, be released next week, I believe. And um, so we would be starting to prepare a report to this committee and work to get um, that report transmitted shortly after that draft application is released to uh, get a sense of what, what the application should look like and get approval for that. Um, the motion itself that was introduced, which um, you, sh you all have, those are, these are all eligible uses of the funds. And it's really important since these are one-time funds and they, um, and the administrative cost is so low. Um, most of these uh, these uses really do reflect things that we're already doing, so that those that we're not creating ongoing needs for funding once this funding is exhausted. Um, we're we're building, as as Molly alluded to before from the county, it's important that we are thinking about a sustainable plan for spending these funds. So the 45 million for for a bridge home and crisis and bridge housing. Um, you're all familiar with that program. This augments that amount of funding that's available to establish those new shelters. An additional 20 million for um, Skid Row emergency response, recognizing the unique needs of that community. 
uh, the 5% for um, youth at, at, who are homeless or at risk of homelessness. Um, a 10 million, which would just basically match the 10 million that's in the UB for a bridge home or other types of emergency um, or services for services and housing for um, people who are homeless, and then the 5% of the admin. So I think that um, the we've also been meeting with the county, as Molly alluded to before, to discuss how we can leverage these two allocations that are being spent. And if you look at the allocations that LASA is proposing and they just discussed, you see how complementary they are. We're not duplicating efforts, but we, our efforts really can feed into one another. And that's really, that's very important to us because we really do want to leverage these funds and make sure that they can be spent according to the deadlines without creating too much of an additional administrative need as well, given the very, very strict um, and low administrative allowance of the funding. So. Um, the, the bottom line really is, again, this is really the important things about this grant is that it is one time and that the administrative um, cap is so low and those tight deadlines for encumbrances really, really do mean that we are looking for ways to leverage what we're doing and leverage so that we aren't creating a, a new administrative needs to start up brand new programs, and, but then also those programs would need ongoing funding past the expenditure of the funds as well. Thank you so much. I think uh, all of us have uh, some questions and comments, but I th we thank you all for your uh, thorough and uh, very clear and, and uh, simple report that's, uh, I think, easy for all of us to understand, but also members of the public who uh, have expressed interest in this by, by coming here. I had a very specific uh, question for, uh, with regard to LASA. There were at least two times in your overview uh, where you said, well, you know, LASA will do this part of this service, and we're recommending that the city of Los Angeles do the excess part. Uh, I'm curious as to how LASA's looking at the other, uh, what is it, 86, 87 cities uh, in LA County, uh, because I know that the, the amount of investment varies widely from municipality to municipality. LASA, uh, the, La the Los Angeles Continuum of Care uh, encompasses 85 cities within the county and unincorporated areas. There are only two large cities who are getting their own allocation of funding from the state, uh, which is the city of LA and um, the city of Long Beach. And the city of Long Beach is not within the LA Continuum of Care. Um, so, um, so in terms of this, this source of funding and coordination on, on that, with the city. We work with all 84 other cities within the LACOC on an on a ongoing and regular basis and engagement of that, um, particularly around alignment of resources um, and like ESG funds and CDBG funds particularly. Um, and work with the county and with the county's homeless initiative um, on continued outreach and engagement. There's 41 cities, um, including the city of LA, um, that saw and received um, planning grants from the county to develop their own set of strategies um, to combat homelessness. Um, and LASA participated in, in that and will be supportive of the implementation um, of those plans um, in alignment with the continuum's um, uh, interests. All right, we'll turn it over to uh, my colleagues, uh, Ms. Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this question also for LASA, what I, uh, given the immense hiring that was required in order to help facilitate, I mean, that is mo one of the most important pieces of how we make sure that we are going to be able to expend the resources that have been made available with such a tight time frame. Where does LASA stand in terms of some of the hiring that has been uh, ongoing for the purposes of outreach and all the other components of Yeah, sure, that. happy to, to report on that. Um, with uh, support from Measure H as well as philanthropy, we've um, stood up a, a pretty robust capacity building effort that includes um, uh, really four, um, three, three pillars. The first is on um, just recruitment. So we've um, not only worked with the workforce development system, created, um, 
easy, easy, you know, one, one place to go to look for all the jobs, um, to fill those jobs. We also um, have um, hired and have on board recruiters who are actually doing recruiting on behalf of our service providers right now. Um, there's been over 700 positions that have been filled um, uh, over the past year um, uh, as a result of those efforts. Uh, and how many and vacancies remain? Uh, I, we don't, um, that's part of what we're hoping from the recruiters is to be able to go out with each, so they're spending time going to each of the agencies, understanding what positions they still have available um, and what the, the needs and requirements are for those positions. So we're in the fact finding piece of that. What we've been getting is just self-reported information from agencies on what they've been able to fill. Um, so, but that's well underway and you're, it's, a, it's a good point and it's something that we, um, with, with the county and with philanthropy and with the city. Um, have been really been focused on for the past two years. Yeah. Um, the other piece of that is once we get all of these people hired, how are, how are they trained and supported in that work? Right. Um, which is really critical. So we've stood up a uh, centralized training academy that uh, provides um, a variety of different trainings, including a baseline introduction into homeless services. Um, that's a 35 hour curriculum. People go through that. It's free for all service providers. We've trained, I think about a thousand uh, people through that um, in the past year. Uh, then we have the next level up from that that for, um, for once people are in the workforce for about six months, they can go back and get um, more applied skills and, and learning, so it's another 35 hour, and then another level on top of that for people who are supervisors and managers to support them um, in that work. Um, and there's a variety of other supplemental trainings that we've done and, um, and other kinds of technical assistance support to support the actual core infrastructure of the service providers, um, the back office operations. Is there dedicated teams by geography so that we have the same individuals that are focused on doing the outreach efforts in the same area so that we're able to connect and engender the trust with the individuals who are facing homelessness. Absolutely, yeah. Our coordinated outreach system, which is a part of our coordinated entry system as a whole, there's about 500 outreach workers that are part of that system. And, and part of that standing that up was not just the larger service planning areas and we're assessing it, but we really got in there and mapped out the whole service planning area and which team has which beat. Um, and when you need a certain kind of resource, like if you're, if, you're a whole, if you're a generalist outreach worker and you need a nurse practitioner, they know who they can go to and call and pull in for that kind of support. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Price. Uh, again, this is a, an exciting opportunity, I think. <clears throat> just, just, just some generic questions again about this uh, uh, proposed $85 million allocation that we are, uh, I guess, proposing. Uh, are, are these categories firmed in the 45, the 20, the 5.75, 10 million? Are these kind of firm uh, guesstimates of our, of our requests? Those are the categories that were, sorry, those are the categories that were proposed by the motion. I mean, this is the opportunity to talk through for the committee to make the recommendation for what the allocation should be to council before they approve the motion. Okay. Well, I'm just sensitive to the, uh, the need for the youth and family housing mm -hmm. services. We had, we heard at least one, uh, maybe two testify about the, the, the need, the desire to increase that. Uh, for youth. I don't know, Mr. Chairman, what the process is. I guess there could be, uh, um, we could keep going back and forth on this, but I'm just, just curious how we can, uh, and, and there, there's also some reference to other services, I think, yeah. uh, in terms of referencing youth. Can you talk, talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, I think so it's, that I think that um, to clarify that the requirement of the legislation is only, is that 5% be spent on youth who are homeless or at risk of homelessness. So the wording here may be a little broader than what I think that this 5% is, uh, is meant to address, which is youth and youth at risk of homelessness. Uh, so not youth and families, just the youth side. The rest of the funding um, could also be spent towards services or facilities that serve youth or serve families for that matter. But this is, this is the allocation that's meant to meet the statutory requirement that the funding be allocated to youth and youth, homeless youth and, and who, or youth who are homeless or at risk of homelessness. So uh, I, I think that might at least address some of the concerns that this is going to be. There is a huge need for family services, I know, and it's it's gotten a lot greater this year and since, especially since Measure H has started implementation. Right. However, this is not meant to be split between youth and families. This is meant to meet the 5% requirement for um, homeless youth and youth at risk of homelessness. Well, anything we can do to provide uh, additional resources for, uh, for youth mm -hmm. uh, services, I think we need to do. It is mm -hmm. increasing, city-wide is increasing in the ninth. 
uh, and so I'm just real sensitive to uh, yes. to that problem and to the allocation of resources to address the problem. Yeah, so this should be dedicated to to youth, and there's other other the other pots of money are I think available to those other needs like families, individuals, and things like that. But the, the statutory requirement is that the funding be spent for homeless youth or youth who are at risk of homelessness. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Price, and again, uh, once again, thank you all for your preparation and presentation on uh, these uh, matters. I'll, I'll uh, move that we approve uh, this item, and we uh, look forward to a successful application, one, and then two, to checking back with you throughout the process uh, as these resources hit the ground and uh, impact our neighborhoods and, and uh, the folks living on the streets. Thank you all so much. All right, uh, that leaves us with uh, public comment, general public comment, uh, one minute each. Uh, Grace Weltman, David Goodsmith, Yelba Carillo. In any order, whoever is closest to the lectern. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Yelba Carrillo, and I'm here representing the Senior Services Department at the Los Angeles LGBT Center in Hollywood. Currently, we have over 4,000 seniors who benefit from our services and over 600 LGBT veterans who benefit from our services. And we're here in support of this motion. Many of our clients have benefited greatly from services and programs currently funded in Los Angeles, such as Skid Row Housing, Prevention and Diversion, and other forms of emergency shelter. However, we must acknowledge the lack of housing specifically geared towards special populations, the LGBT youth, LGBT seniors, and LGBT veterans, who have far more complex needs that are not addressed by current programs. Los Angeles is facing a 22% increase among homeless seniors over the age of 62. There are no shelter or interim housing beds dedicated to LGBT youth and seniors. We ask that consideration be given to allocate funding for services and resources specifically for the LGBT population who are at risk of or currently experiencing homelessness, including our seniors and our youth. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Jill Bauman, Ann Hager, Eric, I don't want to mess up your name, so. I'm going to call you Mr. Eric I. Yes. Hi. Um, a number of us thought we were sign signed up for the public comment for number two and somehow got here. So Just make it happen. Okay, We're here happy we go. to hear from you. I'm Jill Bauman. I'm the CEO of Imagine LA. Imagine LA works with homeless families after they've been housed. Our unique program of ICMS and mentorship not only keeps the families housed, gives them skills and the relationships um, and their community connections and addresses the trauma and breaks their cycle of poverty and homelessness. From our view, we see the traumatic two generational effects of, homeless fam uh, of homelessness on families every day. You know the increases in family homelessness and in the at risk of homelessness population. We urge you to increase the funds for the prevention of family homelessness and utilize the city's family source centers. They're amazing. How amazing it would be to prevent the trauma, especially for the kids, the expense of family homelessness, and have the families remain in their communities. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, hi, my name is Eric Ingerbretson. I'm one of the uh, administrators that runs Penny Lane. Um, what I want to talk about, and Mr. Price mentioned, was the fact is that the youth homeless is in the valley is really overwhelmed. And I see uh, in our permanent and transitional living houses, we have a waiting list. And to mm -hmm. see these kids go out on the street. In the old days, when the kids turned 18, they termed out. Well, nowadays we do transitional living and permanent housing. So we were able to accompany them. The biggest problem is we need money for sites. So I'm for this measure. The more is needed, especially in the San Fernando Valley. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dave Goodsmith, um, I have access to 5,000 square feet of an industrial warehouse space in a heavily um, homeless concentration district and potentially access to a lot more. For the properties that come, um, it's going to be vacant in September, this particular one, so in uh, less than 30 days. Um, and so from a time frame perspective and also uh, who is responsible, so who do I work Wh with? What council district are you in? 
This is the warehouse? This property that I'm talking about is in District 1. District 1? Okay. We'll, uh, our team will work with you to connect you with somebody in District Who, 1. Who's the name? Can I just have one name or is it you? I, I don't. I'm hesitant no because I, I don't represent District 1, so we'll connect you with somebody who does, though. Good afternoon. My name is Richard Keynes, and I'm the Senior Director for Bridge Housing at LA Family Housing. As you know, LA Family Housing has been the, the leading provider of bridge housing and supportive services throughout Los Angeles for the last 30 years. I'd like to acknowledge uh, Council Member uh, Monica Rodriguez and also Jose Huizar for their support for our projects that we have. And while we know that building permanent supportive housing is an ultimate goal, we also know it's imperative to get as many people off the street as possible. We have almost a thousand people in bridge housing every night, and I really support this measure and all the support that we've been given and the renewed political will to help us attack this crisis. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, sir. Could you tell me your name one more time? Richard Keynes. Keynes, thank you. Got it. Yes. Okay. Uh, Sister Diane Smith, Patricia Bates, Jose de Jesus, Ortiz Barreto. I'm Sister Diane Smith. I'm working with the homeless in Venice. And as I noticed that each of the councils uh, uh, get the same amount of money, and I'm, I, I feel like we probably have the most homeless. And so my question is, is it possible to redistribute the money according to where the largest populations of homeless people exist? Also, I have been involved with safe parking. I know it's a very wonderful program. It seems to be popping up all over. But I'm wondering if there's some way of being more organized in terms of being uh, in communication with all of the groups that are doing safe parking. I agree with a uh, comment that's been made before. I wonder if um, December 31st is a bit uh, quick and that date line may, might, be, might be, uh, to be extended. Um, I'm glad that money is being put aside, especially for storage and clean street sanitation program. One of the things I'm finding in people who are opposing uh, uh, this is that the streets need to be cleaned so that people feel like their neighborhoods are respected. Thank you. And please don't get caught up in the fact that I know you have regulations, rules, et cetera, but we need the money now. Good afternoon, uh, Patricia Bates and Sino Neighborhood Council. Um, I am thrilled the state is stepping up and giving some money uh, for this crisis. Um, I'd like to see, uh, as it's allocated to the different uses, um, that we ensure that the areas that, that need it get money. Um, the valley sometimes tends to get shortchanged, um, as do other areas. Um, and just from all the articles in the LA Times, the situation needs to be addressed quickly. Anything that can be done to cut through red tape, to get shower trucks out to people, anything that could be done would really be appreciated. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have Jacqueline Love, uh, Erica Herod, Heather Carmichael. First one, hi, I'm Jacqueline Love. Hi, Ms. Bates, yes. I'm from JL Housing. I first want to thank you guys for all that you're considering doing and doing for this uh, pandemic, is what I call it. And I'm from South Central, and I have a coalition of rental owners, uh, landlords, uh, leasers that have turned their property into transitional housing, permanent housing, and they were considering that if they're gonna do the bridge housing, there are lots of sites in Los Angeles, South Los Angeles, that can be used because South Los Angeles has become a haven for homeless individuals. And so we, at present, have 16,000 homeless individuals, families, youth, together in South Los Angeles. So if there is any funding that can go and be allocated, let it please be some Thank of you so much. to South Los Angeles. Thank you. 
Hello, my name is Heather Carmichael. I'm the executive director of My Friends Place, a community resource center for homeless and runaway young people in Hollywood. We have about 14, nearly 1,500 young people visit us every year. I appreciate the clarity around the 5.75 uh, 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 million to be allocated to young people at minimum to be uh, allocated the 5%. I, am, uh, I would love to be able to see our city ask our state for something more than the minimum for young people who have often received the minimum of family care, the minimum of educational uh, opportunity, and the minimum in uh, systems of care. So I believe we are leaders in Los Angeles and I would like to see us do more than the minimum for these young people. Thank you so much. Uh, we have Richard Keynes, Chris Baca, Frank Buckley, Tori Bailey, Kevin Collins. Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Frank Buckley at the Center of uh, Blessed Sacrament in Hollywood. And my three things I'd like to uh, ask to beg of you is I agree with what the lady said earlier about let's do something urgently. Uh, it's in the LA Times in three areas that I think would be most helpful. I work with people living on the streets on a daily basis would be first and foremost, the severely chronically homeless who've been living on the streets for years, who have no one to advocate for them, that we make them a priority. Second is the white elephant in the middle of the room is uh, addiction so that, especially in Hollywood, I would love to see a detox center and a substance abuse program that was easily accessible to people living on the streets. And last but not least, I'd love to see for people living on the streets wraparound services. I cannot tell you how many hours I've spent in a car running people around the city to no avail. Um, and just as a clinical psychologist, I have to tell you, when someone on the streets is looking for treatment and they get sent from they a mental it. health yeah. clinic a bottle of lithium, clearly the system has failed. So those would be the three areas I would uh, beg for your help. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. I'm Tori Bailey with the CD10. Go ahead. Jay Jolly. I'm one of the homeless liaisons, and I'd like to see that there be a systematically streamlined workflow processes involved. They mentioned 700 hired, but how many were housed within the periods of time? I'd also like to see local hiring focus on immediacy, giving people a chance to work, and that would help eliminate some of this homelessness. Also, I'd like to have some feedback. feedback. We send a lot of people to Hopex and Lhasa, but we have no feedback of what the results are. Happens, yeah. I also like to see, uh, uh, start with how many percentage, what's the percentage of mental illness actually? Everybody puts it on mental illness, but that's not just it. We need to focus more on some prevention measures. I got noticed today that 11 units were being closed down. And I just really need to see some solutions. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, Kevin Collins. Good afternoon, my name is Kevin Collins from 1736 Family Crisis Center. Um, I, I'm, I'm happy to say that I, I, I'm pleased with the services and the funding that is being provided for the homeless population, but I also want, to I want you to understand that the statistics that you all are using will only give you a foundation for the problems at hand. What you really need to look at is the issues that are really going on with these individuals um, and stop looking at the people as numbers begin to look at the people as human beings. And the number one thing that we really need to understand is that one size is not at all. So that whatever situation, you know, whatever program we put out here, we have to understand that we need to meet our clients where they're at and meet the people where they're at. And the number one problem that we have found out here in the streets is that sustainability is not one of the major agendas that we address. Thank you. All right, uh, I think this concludes our public comment speakers uh, with uh, seeing no more items, this concludes our business. We are adjourned. Thank you all so much.